Good evening, everyone, and welcome to episode eight of our FASOMA News Update. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. We are all very excited to be here and to share a lot of interesting, important information. My name is Natalia Morrison, and I am the Director of Communications for FASOMA. And just like you, I am also a licensed acupuncturist. So tonight we are going to talk about Medicare with Jennifer, and then we're gonna talk about homeopathic injections and everything that we've all been seeing on the media about it. We're gonna go over some VA updates and current legal practices during the pandemic, and we'll go over that with David. And finally, with Raphael, we're going to go over any updates regarding uh, small business loans and the PPP loans. So before we begin, I wanted to invite you all to our annual conference. And because of this pandemic, we have shifted and decided to do something really exciting, which is offer the conference virtually. So I wanted to go ahead and show you what that looks like. Um, so this year for our annual conference, what we decided to do differently is that besides it being uh, virtual for you, our FASOMA members, we are offering a really great deal which is for the three days full of webinars, we're going to be doing $180 for all three days and you have the ability of getting up to 24 CUs and PDAs. So our website is fasomacon.com and you can just click on speakers, our schedule, registration, and it gives you all the fun little details. We have an amazing lineup of speakers this year. Chad Bailey, Kathy Goldstein, Shelly Goldstein, Michael Kowalski, which is a favorite as well, Tony, Bob Lynn, who all of you I know love and adore, just like Renee, Bob Quinn, Andy Rosenfarb. This is our first year having him on, and I, for one, am really excited about that. Amy Sears, talking about really important um, medical errors, safety, and also for the first time, human trafficking, which is also very important for all of us to take that class. So I invite you all as our members and our non-members to definitely join us. This is a great opportunity to learn from a variety of different experts. So let's go into some housekeeping. If you look at the bottom of your screen, we have um, a Q&A and a chat box. So in the chat box, you can go ahead and communicate and share with your friends and your colleagues. And if you have any tidbits or comments, you can always go ahead and write it there. I, I'm also running a live poll, just two questions. You are invited to answer them if you're a FASOMA member or if you live and practice in Florida. And we are also having the Q&A section, which we already have someone else that, um, we have someone else that just <laughs> asked the question. So we are going to run through questions in between each in between each segment. And you also have the opportunity to raise your hand and ask your question live. And um, if you wanna do that, I think that'd be really fun and exciting. All right, so without further ado, we're gonna start off with Jennifer Broadwell, who is the Secretary of FASOMA, and she is gonna go over Medicare. Hi, Jen. Thanks so much, Natty. Hi everyone, I'm going to share my screen here with you and we're gonna talk a little bit about what's turned into a tiny bit of a confusing process. So we're gonna to try to kind of clear up some of what's happening with it right now. So our largest national association is the American Society of Acupuncturists. 
And the ASA is a federation of member states. The SOMA is a member state of the ASA. And in order for the ASA to determine whether or not they're going to pursue inclusion in the Social Security Act, they're going to need a majority vote from their member states. So it's really important to PSOMA that we make certain that our members are aware of the information that's out there, of the timelines that are involved, and what they'll need to do in order to make their vote known. Because when that council of votes, when the council of state votes happens, PSOMA will be casting its vote based on our membership vote and that of the board. So it's really important to us that you guys have an opportunity to participate in this and that we can answer your questions along the way. <clears throat> so anything that I'm gonna talk about tonight um, that is a, refers back to the educational brief or any of the town halls that were given, anything like that, I will provide all of the links for that at the end of this, in addition to a link to the new survey that's coming out. So everything will be provided at the end of this. And if there's any questions that I don't get a chance to answer tonight, um, just if they're on here, I'll make certain that I get to them and I'll get them answered for you tomorrow. Um, I might have to hop off the call a little early. So let's go ahead and talk about um, the survey. So the American Society of Acupuncturists, the ASA, developed a Medicare working group. And through that group, they put together an educational brief. Now that brief was sort of everything that we knew at this time, at this moment, to be accurate about Medicare as it stands today. And there were a few things that since the publication of that brief were updated. So after that update was, were, after those updates were incorporated and the most recent town hall last night took place, it detailed all of those updates. So what that did is that made the prior survey um, kind of ineffective, if you will, because you didn't have the most up-to-date knowledge. So what we decided to do, what they decided to do was to take back and deactivate the prior survey. So there is going to be a new link. There is a new link and we'll send that out to you tonight. And we will make sure that that is available on the website, on our Facebook page. Um, we'll be emailing that out. Now you can only take this survey once and the survey is unanimous, or excuse me, it is um, anonymous when the results are sent back to the states. We won't know who answered what, but you will need to put in your identifying information so that they can verify that you're only voting once and if you're a member or not and to which, which association. So we will send that new link out once or excuse me, we will send that new link out to you tonight. You will take that vote only once. And the deadline for this vote is going to be July 12th. So we are really urging you to make your, your voice heard on this. So I think that, you know, one of the most confusing things in this conversation around Medicare has been that we're really trying to predict the future. And it's incredibly difficult to accurately predict something that may happen in the future. Um, there are other people who are included in Medicare, obviously other providers, but they were either included at a time that it was a really different environment, both for integrative medicine and also politically. So it doesn't exactly, um, it, it's not the best, and now it doesn't make for the best analogy for what our process might look like. So that's been one thing that's been a real big difficult thing here. And I think that here in Florida, we might um, have a better kind of understanding of how difficult that could be. And we can really relate to it because it's kind of like trying to predict exactly where a large named storm might make landfall and just how large it might be when it does. So it's, you know, that I think that that's led to some of the confusion in this, but there are a few things that we can all agree upon when it comes to Medicare. So let's take a look at some of those. What we do know is that acupuncture is already a covered service. As of January 21st of this year, Medicare for chronic low back pain with restrictions is already covered. 
And we did get a question earlier in the week asking if anyone in Florida was, was actually billing for that and being reimbursed for that. And the answer is yes. Um, we do know some offices that are billing and are getting reimbursed. It can be difficult the way it's set up because right now licensed acupuncturists are considered auxiliary providers and therefore we require supervision. We're we are considered auxiliary providers because we are not recognized under the Social Security Act as a provider. So in order for you to be billing this right now and getting reimbursed, you would need to be supervised. And that's not the most common setup that most of us are working under. Not of those that are getting reimbursed right now, they are working in offices where they have an MD or a nurse practitioner as the quote unquote medical director. And so they are billing under their NPI and getting reimbursed. But again, they need that level of supervision as this is written today. What we can also agree upon is that acupuncture coverage will likely increase. As we continue to show the safety the, effect, the effectiveness of our medicine and also the cost savings potential here. It is very clear that the approved diagnostic diagnosis codes will continue to grow there. Um, there's already quite a few studies that are looking into expanding those. What we can also know is that um, other providers could certainly perform that acupuncture. Right now, as it's written, MDs, DOs, nurse practitioners, PAs, and critical nurse specialists can perform this. And so can others, only now, as this is, as the, as this is written, they need to be graduates of an ACOM accredited school. What we also know is that there are quite a few of those professions that are in the process of trying to get that language changed so that anyone who has acupuncture within their scope of practice um, will potentially be able to provide these services without that um, ACOM accreditation requirement that exists right now. So that's something we also know will change. Um, we also understand that a lot of our insurance is based on Medicare and what Medicare allows and doesn't. And so as this Medicare coverage continues to expand, it's fair to say that we can expect to see an increase in insurance coverage as well. Um, and that's something that, that we need to really take a look at in terms of our own practices. What we can all agree on as well is the change is constant. And so to take a look at how our individual practices are today, and what Medicare could do for us in the future, whether we seek inclusion or not, is also a very interesting uh, place to, to, to question. So as an example, I have a private practice and it is largely cash pay. It is largely cash pay because the majority of my patients do not have coverage for acupuncture. If Medicare continues to reimburse for Medicare, for acupuncture services. If insurance continues to expand its coverage, it will be interesting to see if my patient base stays the same and continues to come to me when they have that coverage through other providers. So it, it, it can make some interesting changes there. It's also an interesting consideration for those that work in a hospital setting. I also work in a hospital some, and it is a, one of the larger considerations for a hospital is how are they going to really fund an acupuncture program when there's not as much coverage for it through either Medicare or insurance? Um, it can make it a very difficult way to bring that program in on a large scale as something that is other than grant funded if it's not part of the medical mainstream funding model. So let's take a look at some other things because the decision as to whether or not you or I would want to enroll, <clears throat> excuse me, or treat Medicare patients is an, a very important consideration, but there's also others. And that's what it means to be recognized as a profession. And to be listed as a profession within the Social Security Act 
could change quite a few things for us. Now we're going into this realm of potential because we don't know because we've never been recognized here. And most of the, what I'm about to say is not a one-stop process. So it's not that once we get recognized within the Social Security Act, that then all of these other things follow suit. But instead of everything we're about to talk about, everything that happened here, all of these other professions are recognized within the Social Security Act. So it is something that we want to consider this as well. So most recently with our gubernatorial orders that came through from here in Florida, Governor DeSantis, that mentioned what, what healthcare workers were essential, what workers were essential, and kind of delineated that out. Those orders were taken word from word from the CMS language and directly from SSA in terms of who was recognized, which providers. So that's something that Basoma did a lot of work to try to get acupuncturists listed within that as well. And potentially, as we saw it word for word with other professions, if we were listed there, that would have already just come right out. Um, and then there's some other things to look at. When we look at federal student loan forgiveness programs, that's something that is largely funded through HHS and therefore through CMS. And those are offered to all of the professions that are listed within that SSA. Um, the same thing goes with the residency programs. When we look at residency programs for nurse practitioners, for um, MDs, DOs, PAs, these are programs that are largely funded through HHS and through CMS. And again, it's not to say that if we're listed as in, within the Social Security Act, we would automatically have access to residency programs, but we know that all of the residency programs that are funded through these, through this government funds, they all are done to professions that are listed within the SSA. Um, and then I want to take a, a, another look at other regulatory agencies. You know, here in Florida, the practice, our practice is, our license is, um, is governed by the Board of Acupuncture within the Florida Department of Health. But there are many other regulatory agencies that inform what we can claim, how we can market our services and our products, and that largely govern the process of how we really put ourselves out there and what we can say about what we do. And those are agencies like an FDA or an FTC, the Food and Drug Administration or the Federal Trade Commission. And these are agencies that when they are developing a lot of their guidelines and their policies, when they're speaking to their shareholders and their, when they're speaking to other groups and allowing for input in those, those are largely based and come from a profession. And not being recognized as a profession has made it difficult to get involved in some of those conversations in a meaningful way. And so I think that you're going to hear a lot more about the FDA and FTC here in just a moment with David's talk. But that's something that we also want to keep in mind to have this footprint in federal language, in, in federal policy like this really has a, a cascade effect that could have could, could have many implications. So I'm gonna briefly show you some of the resources. And again, these are all gonna be made available on our Facebook page, on our website, and we'll email them out to you directly. Um, but there is the educational brief you can look through. There are the updates to that brief. There are the, I put here the most recent town hall, which was last night. There's also the week prior that you can look at that's available on the ASA website, as well as the NCCOM website the survey itself. And then you're going to see also a link for a talk that was given by HPI that was a largely centered around Medicare legislation and that process of um, how to really, some of our choices and, and potentials for how we can advocate for that. Um, and that was an interesting talk as well. There's a direct link that we'll be sending out. So Thank you guys for your time. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to um, answer a few questions, Natty. And if there are no questions at this moment, then I will be happy to answer those questions later if they come in. Thank you, Jennifer. We do Thank have you. two questions that did come in. 
and and we have someone that's raised their hand wonderful so let's go ahead and run through the question so I, this one seems like it's regarding the survey. If I am licensed in two states, can I vote in both or just in one? Just in one. You can only vote one, one vote for, per person, regardless of the amount of states that you're licensed in or the associations that you belong to. So I would suggest to vote with the state that is your primary residence or your primary practice. Um, it really doesn't matter which state kind of gets that vote, if you will, it'll still be heard. But it's a great question and only one vote. Wonderful, thank you. All right, so we did have someone raise their hand. Vera, I'm going to allow you to talk. It should open your mic. Go ahead, Vera, and ask us your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hi, welcome, and thank you for being here with us. Thank you. Uh, my question uh, about coverage for Medicare. You, we have now discussion with uh, Medicare about coverage uh, with a different kind of problem. For me, it's mostly interesting about cancer patient who has a lot of side effects from chemo, from radiation, well, many things we know about this. If we discuss about this and will be covered in the future, in this year or maybe in the future? Vera, that's such a great question and uh, kudos to you for, um, for, having, for, for doing such great work with oncology patients. Um, and, and it would be fantastic to see that covered. Unfortunately, it's too hard to predict how long that would take to get any specific you know, diagnosis covered. Um, the good news is, is that is something that is side effects for chemo, um, especially with uh, nausea, are is oftentimes covered with insurance. So that's something that that might you might be able to find there. But to answer your question, it's going to be too too difficult to really put a timeline on when we might be able to get additional diagnostic codes for that, and then kind of what order those would go in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. All right, wonderful. So now we are going to jump over with David Bibby, who is going to go over homeopathic injections, the updates on VA, and current uh, legal practices for us all during the pandemic. Hi, David. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, Jennifer, for the um, the information regarding Medicare. Um, let me start with the last thing first. I'm going to start with Florida only because we're still in the full phase one and the beginning of phase two. Um, there are there has been some movement we heard recently with closing of bars and again a twenty a reduction to twenty five percent capacity on restaurants. But these are issues that affect commercial industry that's not related to healthcare. And so I would go back at this point and say that there's no new developments with uh, healthcare providers or acupuncturists specifically uh, that we need to be mindful of at this phase of time, this uh, part of the pandemic response. Um, as we saw in Palm Beach, Broward and Miami-Dade counties that under phase two, there were some, uh, some limiting language on practice of acupuncture that was bundled in with personal services businesses. Uh, we've worked, and I say FSOMA has worked with our uh, governmental affairs and led in lobbying team and attorneys, worked directly with the governor's office as well as the general counsel's office to get assurances that uh, there would be no res tighter restriction in phase two that's, you know, in writing than there was in phase one. The whole point in going from phase one to phase two was that there would be less restrictive, but somehow for reasons that, you know, are difficult to explain and largely bureaucratic, phase two as it applies to acupuncturists was more restrictive um, in those three counties uh, and that they were holding those businesses still closed. Um, we had assurances from the governor's office and we had assurances from the general counsel's office that 
uh, that was unintentional and that there would not be any enforcement actions taken against acupuncturists who chose to practice in those three counties, provided that they were following, the providers are following the guidelines from the CDC and the Florida Department of Health. So with regard to patient screening, proper use of PPE, documentation, referrals when necessary for testing, as long as all of these things are, are being complied with uh, by the individual practitioner, no matter where they are statewide, the understanding that we have from the governor's office and the general counsel's office is that there's no limitation or restriction on practice, okay? Um, and in phase three, if and when that, that comes, uh, we were told that any executive order or printed material that's generated from the Florida Department of Health would no longer list licensed acupuncturist or the term acupuncture establishments in with uh, the personal uh, services businesses and instead uh, they would probably, acupuncturists would be unmentioned only because they are then fall under the broader category of um, licensed healthcare providers, licensed healthcare practitioners, essential healthcare providers. So it, there would be no, you know, written or articulated distinction between uh, acupuncturist and any other healthcare provider. The VA, we had an update on the Veterans Administration about a month ago, specifically uh, addressing the recoup efforts from TriWest dating back to January 1st for services rendered um, at the VA fee schedule where providers were reimbursed. And the TriWest was sending letters basically recouping, demanding repayment of a portion of those fees. Uh, the ASA and some of their uh, leadership partners and committee uh, chairs were involved in discussions at the VA and at TriWest at the highest levels where uh, the CCN community care network intersects with the VA policy. And the takeaway from that, and this, this information is about four weeks old, was that TriWest was going to terminate, um, cease and desist their recoup efforts on um, claims that were paid uh, prior to April 1st. And that if services were um, provided in January, February, March, um, all the way up to the beginning of April, and those claims were paid, that that was water under the bridge, and that TriWest was gonna implement the Medicare fee schedule. They were gonna move from the pre-existing VA fee schedule to the lesser amount of the Medicare fee schedule effective April 1st, I believe, maybe April 2nd, however those, those days fall. So dates of service for care that fell after April 1 would have the Medicare fee schedule um, that was published at that time applied to care provided for acupuncture services. And that would apply to any provider who is in the CCN or VA that provides acupuncture services. So it could be an acupuncturist, it could be a medical doctor, it could be um, some other technician that is approved through VA processes to provide acupuncture services. But the rate would be the same irrespective of the provider type. And that we have to remember going forward, the larger conversation that Jennifer was just having is that acupuncture is in demand. The, and the providers of acupuncture are less important to the people who are making a lot of these decisions. It's nothing pejorative against acupuncturists. They're not trying to exclude or diminish us in some way. They're just saying that we want the benefits. Medicare is gonna want the benefits. VA wants the benefits. Medicaid here in Florida wants the benefits. Um, workers' Comp wants the benefits. All of these big government supported um, insurance plans as well as private insurance plans, they want the non-opioid option of pain treatment and management, and they want the historical safe and effective benefits of acupuncture to be made available to their members. The obvious choice for providing that care is licensed acupuncturists because we have an overwhelmingly superior training and education in how to best use that, 
But that is an academic argument in some ways. You know, there are people who make the argument that with 300 hours of training, a medical doctor can do this as well as anybody else. And if they're accustomed to and routinely accepting Medicare reimbursement rates, they're not going to turn the whole model of healthcare reimbursement upside down for 40,000 licensed acupuncturists in the country. We've got 70,000 chiropractors, almost twice the size of our profession, that can provide Medicare services, deliver acupuncture with certification, and they're ready, willing, and able to have another service that they can bill and, and provide. So the broader conversation is how does acupuncture as a profession and individual professionals stay relevant in the delivery of our medicine? Um, and my quick comment on that would be that the healthcare delivery model that we've grown so accustomed to um, has been volatile for the individual provider. And we can look to the left and we can look to the right and we can look at our colleagues and friends and see who have uh, survived and maintained strong practices and who have had to choose other career options or income options and say something is going to have to give in order to provide more certainty for the profession and for the medicine here in, in throughout the country. And that certainty is opening access to care to 80 million people in the next five years under Medicare, another 25 million under Medicaid programs or more, you know, millions of veterans, millions of people that are under these uh, larger plans. So the delivery model that each of us is so accustomed to uh, in private practice is going to have to adapt um, in this several ways. I don't want to get too far afield with that question, but ways that we need to re-envision what we do and how we deliver those services so that when providing it at a lower rate per encounter with uh, patients who need acupuncture care, we can make uh, sustainable models for ourselves individually as providers and also um, a sustainable model for the profession. And we can continue to deliver the highest quality, most uh, clinically expert care in acupuncture nationwide. There shouldn't be any provider um, who's able to do that better than acupuncturists, but it's on us to make the most of that opportunity to demonstrate it. And we can't do that by hiding uh, you know, behind a tree. We have to get out in front of this question. Um, so Jennifer did an excellent job bringing forward some of those thoughts. The survey uh, is an effective way for us to poll the profession and that you know, helps determine you know, how, how we proceed, you know, where is, which way is the wind blowing on this question. And the last uh, area that I wanted to touch on tonight was the uh, question of FDA warning letters to the homeopathic uh, manufacturers that uh, we're familiar with, um, Medinatura, Viatrex, Whole Health Systems, and Hevert received um, a warning letter of three of the only one of the th of the four Viatrex actually had a, a much longer and more involved um, complaint letter warning letter from the FDA that went beyond some of the new drug claims and product marketing problems that they had uh, with language that those companies were using and the the complaint and the warning letter for Viatrex extended into the CGMP standards that are necessary for manufacturing products that are sterile for injectable purposes. And unfortunately, the FDA found several glaring problems with compliance there. And that resulted in the fact that the company could not, um, you know, certify or substantiate that the product they were making was sterile, and yet they're selling it for injection purposes. So. Um, the situation of Viatrex is slightly more complex than it is at Medi Natura, um, Whole Health, um, Homeopathic, and um, Hever. And the complaints with those three companies really extend to something that Jennifer touched on with the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, who works hand in hand with the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, to coordinate the review of statements made by uh, manufacturers that include claims about either treatment effectiveness or indications of use for products that 
have not been through a um, FDA pre-market approval process that includes demonstration that effectiveness studies have been done to substantiate those claims. So historically, we're familiar with the Deshay Act as it applies to uh, natural foods and supplements, as well as traditional Chinese herbs and things that we're using in our practice daily, that, um, that there's exemptions for those, those products, but to the extent, exemption for pre-market approval, but to the extent that you can make claims about that, you can't. You, know, you can make structure function claims and that this is how something um, you know, works in the body and it's indicated for use, usually is gonna fall along symptomatic lines which is much different than stepping up and saying, this product is used to treat COVID-19, or this product is used to treat rheumatic arthritis. Um, when there's no clinical studies that um, demonstrate that to a scientific certainty that the FDA has approved. So the way that you, you, know, that you avoid treading into the new drug requirements for the FDA is you just don't make those statements. You can say that this product is for heat, redness, swelling of the joints. It's for, you know, um, painful stabbing, you know, conditions. And, and, you know, you can describe gout or rheumatic conditions in any way you want, other than using a, the condition's name and saying that you're going to treat for it. And when you look at the, either the provider guidance or the patient uh, materials that are, included on those claims, um, they are wildly specific. And so it's no wonder that this is uh, the question of, of coming under the purview of the FDA and the FTC. The last thing I'm going to say on that is that there has been a, a shift at the FDA starting in 2018 where they have moved the goalpost they have changed their policies. Literally, they have rewritten the guidance that in, had formally, and I say up until when they withdrew their last um, guidance document on this, I think in the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, historically, things that were under HPUS and uh, homeopath homeopathic preparations were considered exempt from pre-market approval, and there was a lot of um, acceptance and looking the other way when it came to claims and other statements made by those companies. But that's, you have to understand, that's an FDA policy. They chose actively to do that, um, and they can choose actively to not do that. And this is what's happened since 2018. They've been working with um, homeopathic working groups from that industry that have been revising and eliminating certain exemption statuses for the whole classification of homeopathic drugs. And part of the reason was because some of the well-recognized companies that I just named have been making statements that made uh, the FDA uncomfortable about, you know, uh, certain prescriptions, treating conditions, um, and or the complexity of the the, the composition of the formula, it seems like it, it's gone away from some of the simple single ingredient things that were common to uh, homeopathics when they started doing uh, combination formulas. The other thing that, you that we have to bear in mind is that when the homeopathic statute was brought into the FDA, and I believe it dates back to like 1921, it's something in the, in the early part of the 20th century in the 1920s, is that there were only probably oral uh, drugs being used in homeopathic medicine. Uh, they, they may have had some homeopathic preparations as well, but the extending that into an injectable um, delivery, bypassing the GI, and I saw some of the statements from the FDA's concerns about things being injected directly into the bloodstream. Um, we don't do that under our scope of practice, um, but they just made the point that um, without further scrutiny of the individual ingredients, irrespective of the infinitesimal dose strategy and uh, basis for homeopathics, is that they were uncomfortable with some known toxic ingredients getting injected directly into the body. And so some of this, to me, when I read through the warning letters, were very specific. You know, you're doing this, it is against the law, 
um, as the law is currently written. We are moving the goalposts and we've come up with new policies that you need to comply with. And if you don't comply with them, these products are gonna be withdrawn from the market. So it creates a, a burden on the homeopathic industry to do some housekeeping. And the only thing that I would, I guess the last thing I'd, I'd say about that is that this is not a new problem. And that, and I said 2018, but dating back to 2015, the FDA had already signaled very clearly to the homeopathic industry that it was looking at these specific problems um, at what they perceived as specific problems with the industry and their products, whether they were oral, topical, but especially injectables. And so with five years later, um, there's been some sort of breakdown between the homeopathic consortium and its ability to communicate effectively with their uh, counterparts at the FDA to keep the regulation of, of homeopathics on the, on the same trajectory that it's historically been on. So whatever that breakdown was, it, it falls to the homeopathic industry to sort out. And, you know, as consumers, both as practitioners and our patients, we, you know, we want them to be able to, you know, find whatever way forward that they have to, to continue to make those products available. But um, there's certainly no tolerance from on my part when it comes to them making statements and, um, you know, choosing to do business in a way that's in conflict with, you know, either historically in conflict with the law or that's something that's not, that does not comport with the new regulations. They are just like you and I are responsible for making sure that we understand the rules of the road and that we comply with them for ethical and practical reasons. So too does the homeopathic industry. Um, so the issues of labeling and communication about pre-market materials is slightly different than the manufacturing standards problems that Viatrex is having. But either instance, that's on them to try to uh, make sure that they work with their FDA, FTC counterparts, regulators to make sure that they can get all of that, um, you know, back on the same page. Um, there's, I see some questions ticking off uh, with the um, on this question, so I'm going to kick it to Natalia to go ahead and let's work through the questions and hopefully we have uh, ready answers. And I welcome input from Jennifer and Raphael as well if there's anything that, you know, help me with the, the answers, okay? Thank you, David. So we're gonna go over the questions that all of you submitted in the Q&A section. And remember that if you wanted to ask a question live, you can do that by just raising your hand and it'll prompt me to go ahead and open your mic. So the first question that we have here, David, it says to the attorney, aren't these homeopathy injection health claims only directly to practitioners? If so, what's the real danger to the public? You know, I'm sorry. I know you, you read that carefully, and, and, uh, but I just didn't get the, the full question. I'm sorry. Aren't these homeopathic injection health claims only directly to practitioners? If so, what's the real danger to the public? Um, the answer to that is no. The, most of the citations on the warning letters came from investigation of the company's public websites. And so they had comments specifically uh, to the information that's provided to the public in both downloadable like PDF forms that are available on their websites. Um, that, that, that's where the, I'm sorry, and the, the other area is for companies who host a uh, feedback, like a Q&A on their website for uh, endorsements and, uh, you know, supporting comments from patients is that there are people that say, you know, I had two injections of Tremila and I'm out of my wheelchair, you know, and, and, you know, making sort of uh, extraordinary claims and, um, and that information is also not supposed to be uh, posted in a, in a way that's not edited um, that, you know, again, it's that linkage between you making treatment and outcome claims that are anecdotal. Uh, they don't like that with the product name. And again, the, the, these um, claims that were made in both practitioner and in and patient literature. Okay, next question. Any issues with using heel injectables? Yeah, I did not see, there's no warning letter to heal. 
and the or, or to heal products so they're not included in this um discussion with um the you know what's cited in the letter is that it's it's what is illegal is the interstate sale and and shipping of these materials that make those statements so that's why there was sort of the fda's warning letter impeded the company's ability to sell their product because not because they couldn't sell it but because they couldn't ship it to to customers whether they're providers or anybody else so heel's not included in that heel can continue shipping and and selling its product um and the the other thing i'd say and it's not specifically part of this question but the it has come up and maybe we'll see it again is what if i have some injectables in my in my closet you know in my storage room i ordered some and they're still in date can I use them? And what I would encourage people to do is, is, is go to the FDA website and they have a section for um, product recalls and whether they're voluntary or mandatory product recalls. If there's a product recall from the FDA on a batch or a named product um, in certain lot numbers, then the answer is no. The companies are supposed to voluntarily take those products back that probably um, either issue a credit or some sort of return memo for, for the provider who had purchased those things. Um, but if the FDA warning letter is to the company and it doesn't also trigger a recall, then the products that are in your, in your office, um, I, I don't, I don't see where, if, if it's not recalled and you own it, then you can, then it's something that you can use. And the warning letter is, is really an administrative warning letter to the companies that is letting them know that they're on the FDA's radar and they have 10 days or 14 days or 21 days to respond in terms of how they're going to correct those, um, whatever the FDA is citing. Wonderful. Cause that was our next question okay. and you just answered that. All right. Do you have any research around homeopathic use in history or current research being done? I would contact on injectables. He, the, the second part of that. Um, oh, injectables. I yeah, see that. On injectables. And, I, and I'm going to interrupt for a second. Someone in the chat box asked if any Hebrew products were banned. Again, so banning is, is you have to I'm look right. at it's, right right. it, it's the, the question is, is if the, if the, if the FDA has issued a warning letter to Hevert and Hevert has inventory in their plant, they cannot ship it because it's going to require interstate commerce or even in-state commerce. You can't, they can't sell it. This is basically saying you, you're on hold until you solve these packaging problems or pre-market problems as we see it. Um, but that the warning letter is being directed to the manufacturer or the distributor of the product. It's not being directed to the consumer or the provider. So the way that the FDA communicates um, with consumers or providers would be vis-a-vis -a, -vis a, a recall. And or again, I think there's there's actually three components. They have a mandatory recall, a voluntary recall, and then they have they have a third category of somehow of recall. And, but it's very easy to see. You go to the web, FDA website for recall, put in the company name, or even just put in homeopathic, and it'll pull up any recalls. Um, and then you can just double check that the companies you're doing business with have they have either the company instigated a recall through the FDA's website, or has the FDA stepped in and, re, and, and published that themselves? And I say if there isn't one, then there's no directive being made toward the provider or the consumer. It's being made toward the manufacturer. Wonderful, thank you. And so does that answer, is there, oh no, is there any current research around homeopathic injections in, use in history or current research being done, if you're aware of that? I, you know what, I, I, would, I would contact the manufacturers um, and ask them because they very well may either have white papers that are based on um, research that they've conducted or they may have participated in research programs either in the US or more likely in Europe or Asia that included or Australia that included um, homeopathic injectables. Uh, you can go to Medline you know or PubMed and just put in homeopathic injectables and see what pops up. That's, that's sort of the clearinghouse for published research to see what's out there. Uh, and I'm sure that this is part of the conversation that 
you know, hopefully is available, you know, data that's available to the manufacturers to say, um, you know, let's, let's revisit some of the data on, on research that's been done to help them support uh, some of their claims. But again, the claims fall on, you know, automatically make it a drug. If you're going to make claims that it treats, cures, or mitigates something, then that's a drug. If you're going to make a structure function claim that it's something that addresses symptoms, then it's not a drug. So it's, it's a bit of a communication problem. And I think that the companies are just out over their skis a little bit. And I'm sure that they're working with their lawyers and whoever manufacturers or you know, prints their labeling and their packaging to say, we can either demonstrate the efficacy and produce the studies that substantiate this and go through a new drug approval process, or we can just change the way that we market our product so that we come back under what's acceptable. And I think the second route is gonna be the, the more acceptable one. In the short term, I think in the long term, they would make it, they'd see the investments are worthwhile in making substantiating these claims because it's, it enhances the credibility of their company and they will drive sales, but it's something, you know, they have to figure it out. Thank you. So I think you've already answered this one. Acupuncturists can still offer injectables. Question mark. And next question, are Chinese herbal injectables not allowed because they are not FDA registered? Um, I, I, you know, I can't answer that question. You know, I, I think that there's a number of reasons why, and it may be even something simple like, you know, I, I don't mean to oversimplify the answer, but you may have to just you know, all of us, anybody doing injectables is supposed to be a, a product that's been uh, disclosed to your malpractice insurance company, disclosed to the board uh, that you're doing injectables. Uh, but, in, and so there may be a question right there is, I don't know that any of the malpractice insurance coverage companies are going to approve acupuncturists injecting Chinese herbals um, as something that's a covered under their, under their policy. Um, and I'm not an expert in that area, but I'm just I'm thinking that when you read the 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 rule in 64B1 as it applies to acupuncture injections, they have to be sterile, they have to be homeopathic, they have to be a nutritional substance um, or a vitamin. So as you know, where Chinese herbal falls specifically under that one of those three categories, or let's say two. Um, categories because it's not homeopathic it's something else um, and say it's going to be under a, a nutritional substance because it's an herb is is it a is it something that's verify verifiably a sterile substance and is it something that's intended for um, you know sub q or im injection and will your malpractice insurance carrier cover you for for claims and that's something i think as you know as a provider you want to make sure that all of those I's are dotted, T's are crossed, and that, and that you you have confidence in the that it's safe and effective for what you're using it for, and you know it doesn't have to be a, a claim that's generated because of you know an adverse event to the to the injection. It could be any number of things that 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 may happen uh, in the delivery of that injection that that come under scrutiny in terms of a malpractice claim. Thank you. What are the studies that point to the FDA that homeopathics are toxic as those were other claims that the FDA had for the homeopathics? Well, they didn't say that they were toxic. The warning letter said that it, it includes toxic substances. And I think we would agree that antimony, lead, arsenic, you know, things like this, they are toxic substances. And even, you know, people familiar with homeopathy and, and the FDA disclosed in their letters that they, they understood the infinitesimal dosing strategy with uh, homeopathy, but notwithstanding that, they were concerned about the sourcing, the sterilization of the products. And again, this only applied to injectables. So you can see some of the same like formulas, um, whether it's, um, you know, a uh, Arnica Montana or something that's either an injectable form or an oral or a topical form. And the only aspect of the warning letter that was addressed to these companies uh, specifically was for the injectables. And so there's sort of a confluence of concern. They, can, they say that they're, 
they were addressing things on a on a tiered level and at the highest level were things that were injected uh, that included uh, potentially toxic ingredients uh, or known toxic ingredients irrespective of the dose um, potentially and infectious materials you know human materials animal based materials and so they make a pretty you know substantial argument that the sourcing and um, purification of, of in the dosing of those products all are of a concern or a new concern and they're saying you know and basically when I say they're moving the, the goalposts they're saying that under historical um, concepts and standards at the FDA these products in whatever dose that they were you know substances and doses that they were using um, seemed fine but under a heightened heightened standard of of concern about that um, they're earning greater scrutiny and they're just basically telling everybody they're not hiding behind any excuses they're saying we're looking at this in a whole new way and you may or may not still enjoy some of the um, sh the shielding that was provided in previous um, under previous policies or previous um, standards so the companies are saying you know it's an it's a new day you might have to do this in another way Thank you. And last question. If they, homeopathic injectables, go through the drug evaluation process and become a drug, will they then still be available to us as acupuncturists to inject? Yeah, I think what they would be classified as a, as a, as a legend drug and not as a controlled substance. So it would be available to us like, you know, like B12 injections and other things. Wonderful. So those are all the questions. Oh, I think no nope, one just came in. And again, I'm sorry. I'm saying that without seeing the, the the future rule. You know, they may they may come up with some classification and put it behind a a glass wall that requires some sort of scripting requirement. But it, it to me, my first instincts on it would be no, because it would it's historically been available. There's really all we're doing it all, all that they would be doing is making certain substantiating their claims in some way. There's no change to the formula, no change to anything. Um, but they they write the rules and they can move the goalposts wherever they want them. But all things being considered equal, I would say it would, it would be, a, I'd expect it to be a legend drug and available, okay? Thank you, David. And one last question, it's not homeopathic specific, but it is injection specific. Is it true we cannot inject substances like vitamins made from a compound chain pharmacy? Um, again, I, it, I think this, sometimes it depends on the pharmacy, you know, it depends on what it is that, that they're injecting. Um, but if we, and I know that there's a lot of um, providers out there that uh, you know, have it sort of sort of advanced training or advanced understanding about how to use those things, and they feel like combinations of products that are otherwise safe separately should be safe when used together. And historically, they got them in a compounding pharmacy. What I would say is that the FDA has been working very hard, you know, to increase the scrutiny. Um, of how compounding pharmacies are regulated and what products they can make and what products they can resell and to whom they can resell them. And I, and I guess I can't speak as specifically um, to this as the, as the question, the questionnaire probably wants, except to say that, you know, if you were doing vitamin B injections, simple, straightforward vitamin B injections, they're made and available and from a variety of different um, suppliers, then the answer is you can continue doing that. The more exotic your option is in terms of the vitamin that you choose or the combination of products that are in that vitamin injection, then I would say the complexity in getting uh, a hold of that product is probably getting harder and harder. And, um, and, it, and I expect it to continue to be that way. Thank you, David. So let's move on with Raphael. And Raphael is going to go over small business loans and PPP um, loans and any current updates with that. Hi, Raphael. Hi, uh, 
Good evening, everyone. Next time, Raphael's going to say, I go, I go before David. <laughs> um, so good evening everyone so just get a little quick update I'll try to be brief on here um, you know the nice thing about the PPP loan is there's just so much information out there that a quick Google search basically gives you everything you need and the SBA has done a really good job of um, having very clear and direct links on their website so originally um, I'm going to back up first I want to say a, part of the CARES package was everyone's going to get a coronavirus payment if you haven't gotten it, there is a, um, an area on the IRS website. It's actually called Get My Payment Portal. You can fill out some information and kind of track down where this money, if you haven't gotten it yet, um, the $1,200 um, grant that they were gonna give out to everyone. Then the PPP loans originally were set to expire the application on June 30th. The House and Senate have voted to extend the program until August 8th. Um, the last that I read, I looked right before coming on, uh, the president is expected to sign it uh, quite soon. So basically what that means is if you didn't apply for a PPP loan before the June 30th deadline, it looks like it's going to still be opening up to do that. Uh, the last I read, there was still some monies available uh, and PPP funds were still there. Uh, a few things that I think is important for everyone to know, if you have taken out a PPP loan, once your covered period, you basically have 10 months after your covered period ends, to either apply for the forgiveness or make payments. So basically, if you don't apply for the forgiveness, you really gotta start making payments after 10 months. That's a deadline. Hopefully everyone on here is gonna apply for the forgiveness and at least get some partial forgiveness or total forgiveness. Something else that's um, a big change that I think is an improvement for a lot of people is before they had a very strict eight week forgiveness policy, you basically had to use all of the money in eight weeks and 75% of that had to go specifically to payroll 25% could be used for um, a few options. One of them was rent, some utilities, and other expenses. Um, that has been changed. Now you can switch to a 60% payroll and 40% um, basically covered, covered uses, uh, which is nice because you can use that for rent and some other things which you weren't able to before. The other change that, that occurred was they extended the payback period from eight weeks to 24 weeks. Um, but if you got your loan before the 5th of June, you have the options to use either or. If it's after June 5th, uh, you're gonna, your forgiveness period is going to be the shorter of either 24 weeks or December 31st. Some people, December 30, 31st will arrive before the 24 weeks. So those are basically your two choices now in the forgiveness periods. There is another requirement that if you had any employees, you need to maintain the same level. So if you're a single employee, if you were by yourself, no problem, you're going to pay yourself and you're fine. Uh, you can't go, um, I want to say it's less than 30 hours. You need to maintain at least 30 hours of payroll to be a full-time equivalent employee. If you have multiple employees that you were paying, either other acupuncturists or office staff, uh, you need to bring them back on board. Um, if you were using the eight-week period before the eight weeks are over, and if you're using the 24-week period, you need to bring, bring back full-time staff on there. Um, and then uh, a couple of new developments regarding the forgiveness forms. They're already online. I suggest anyone who has a PPP loan to download the forms, take a look at them and start working with the information on there. The more you know now, the less uh, you have to worry about it. And I, I recommend everyone to really talk to your um, accounting professional or attorney on this uh, because we really don't know yet the forgiveness. We haven't, I don't think we've gotten into anyone has completed an eight week period. So we, no one's really actually gone through the process yet. So it's better to be on the safe side, read all the fine print and, 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 uh, and look over that. So the forms are available. And additionally, they've made a new form. The form is actually called the 3508 is the form. They made an easy version of it. Um, makes it a little shorter. The regular form is, um, it is a four page form. Uh, the easy form is a two page form. Um, that I think really becomes uh, useful for anyone who is self-employed and they get a Schedule C. If you get a Schedule C, you're basically making income at the end of the year. My understanding is you can get the full amount. Whatever they give you as a loan, you can take it full and write it off instantly if, you're a, if you file a Schedule C. Um, and I think that was the main things that I wanted to cover. So um, the schedule C, who can use an easy form? Those who are self-employed or have no employees, they can do it. 
And then uh, those who did not reduce the salaries or wages of their employees by more than 25% and did not reduce the number of hours of the employees. Or um, they experienced a reduction in their business activity as a result of health, health directives related to COVID-19 and did not reduce the salaries or wages of their employees by more than 25%. So there's some minor little things, but all that information is readily available. I'm seeing a few things popping up in the background on the EIDL. I haven't read the question, um, but EIDL, you can still apply for that. My understanding is you can apply for the loan um, until the December, the end of the year, basically, you can still apply for that. Part of the EIDL application process is you first ask for a grant. Um, my understanding is there have been some hiccups in the grant process and people who have applied for the grants still have not received them. My understanding is, is that you can accept the grant without taking out the loan portion. If you take out the loan portion, they will count the grant towards that, um, towards your PPP forgiveness or towards your loan. Um, the EIDL, the Emergency Income uh, Disbursement Loan, is not forgivable. That's a loan that you will take out. Um, you basically start paying it back. I want to say it's end of the year you start paying it back. It's at a very low interest rate of 3.5%. I believe you have 30 years to pay it back um, at a fixed rate. Uh, you are restricted on what you can use it for. So you can't just get this money and say, well, I'm gonna pay off my house loan because this is a better rate. There's certain things that you have to, that, that you can use it for. Basically business related things, rent, ongoing business concerns and things like that. So there is some restrictions if you wanna take that out. So be aware of that. If they ever audit you in the process and they ask for that, they're gonna ask for those documentations. So in any of these things, whether it's a PPP loan or EIDL, you really need to keep good record keeping. Um, I think when it's all said and done, a lot of this process is gonna be, you know, you're gonna agree like, yes, I use this for these, for these uh, allowable reasons and you'll self-certify and you're fine, but you may be asked for these documents and you will be required to provide them. Um, so I'm gonna go into some questions. Um, I'm gonna read directly through them. There is one that Stuart um, uh, asked um, and I'm going to read it. It may pertain to David. So we'll go through that one first before we get into my information, just to wrap up all the, uh, actually it just got removed. Okay. So Julia asks, is that the same as the EIDL? Do you have to apply for forgiveness for the EIDL? So for the EIDL, you cannot apply for forgiveness. That's actually a loan. What is forgivable is the PPP loan. That's the payroll protection program. And then you also have, as far as free money goes, the grant. Um, so that answers Julieta's question. I will mention one thing about unemployment. In case anyone is on unemployment now, um, the, the extended benefits last until July 31st, where the federal government is, is giving an additional $600 a week. That will end on the 31st. And then it goes back to the standard state of Florida unemployment. So I did want to mention that. Um, so Dr. Elaine asks, can you still get a grant only through the EIDL program? Yes, you can. If you have not applied, for the grant, you can still apply for it is my understanding. Uh, there is some hiccups along the process. Um, for example, I applied for my grant. I haven't gotten it yet. I went through a reapplication process. So there's people who still haven't gotten it yet. Um, so let's go to the next question. Um, this is from Annie. I received an SBA EIDL loan and can't find info on how to repay or get forgiveness. Uh, it was just deposited into my account with no communication from DSD. What do you recommend? Okay, so my thoughts on that is, um, you know, I, I think strategically as a business owner, it may not be a bad idea to have this source of cheap capital. 3.5% for a bank to give out money and the amounts that are giving is pretty high. So um, if you have a need for the money to run your business and you can make a good strategic decision saying, I'm going to use this money to keep my business afloat um, and you have a plan of how you're going to pay it back because remember it is a loan you're not going to get the eidl forgiven so someone may say well I, I may be a little slow over the next two or three months let me have some money to be able to cover my rent to cover my payroll to cover my expenses while things pick up um, you know we don't have a crystal ball we don't know what's going to happen in the future but i think everyone generally expects that you know, corona, coronavirus will get under control. Maybe the virus will get a little weaker. Some people talk about a vaccine. Is that feasible, reasonable? I, I couldn't tell you that. Um, but these are business decisions that we really have to think long and hard about that are important. 
because if you get a loan, you have to pay that back. The terms are very favorable. Um, you know, I think it ends up being 3.75% over 30 years. So, um, you know, I did a quick and dirty calculation. I want to say on a hunt, if they lo loaned you hundred thousand dollars, you would be paying it back. I think the payment is under $400 a month. So, you know, but it, it, it's over a very long period that you're going to be paying back. So I really think those become business decisions. And, um, you know, it's always best to speak to like a, some kind of consultant, an accountant, a financial consultant advisor to understand these business decisions if you don't have a good role on that. Uh, you know, unfortunately, not only are we acupuncturists, but we have to run business. So a lot of the decisions we make, we have to base them on what is best for us to keep our doors open, keep on making money and feed our families while helping the public. Um, my personal thoughts when this started was, is I thought it was, I made a lot of financial decisions on my business based on, I want to make sure that in two, three, four months when this pandemic calms down, when I'm able to start treat, where, where I'm feeling comfortable to start treating patients again, I want to make sure that I can open up my doors. There's other acupuncturists who have never closed their doors. They've kept on treating patients. So there's a lot of personal and business decisions that go into those questions. Um, so I, so I hope that helped, um, Annie. Now, Lucem asks, um, how about an S-Corp? So these loans, um, my understanding is, yes, you can, you can pull them out as an S-Corp. You're actually, the corporation is, is pulling out the loans. Um, I run my business through a corporation, so I applied for everything through my corporation. I, am, I don't operate as a sole proprietor, um, but I imagine that you have these same, uh, these same kinds of loans available if, if you know, at whatever format your business runs. Um, so I hope that answers that question for Lou. So Stuart, it says, I received my PPP loan, done with my eight weeks. Be sure to check with the bank that provided the loan as they may require their own form submitted to the SBA. PNC has their own reimbursement form they require. Yeah, okay, that's a really, really good question that uh, Stuart brings up. Um, so the reality of it is, is the, uh, the PPP loans, you got them through a bank and you signed an agreement with the bank and the bank agreements should uh, parallel what's dictated in the CARES Act. Um, I have read out there that it, not, it doesn't always directly uh, correspond to what the CARES Act does. It is supposed to by law. Um, but yes, it is very important to check with your bank um, and see if there's any forms and any requirements that they have, because they, they may decide we're going to you know, be a little uh, more careful than the SBA, and we may want copies of something. So that'll, that'll all be specified in your loan agreement for the PPP loan uh, with your bank. Uh, so I hope that answers that question, Stuart. If you want to add something or something else, just let me know. Um, Maria, she asked, I thought you said a partial 10K will be forgiven if gotten an EID loan, but not grant or bridge loan. Okay, so I'll try to answer that as best as I can understand the question. The EIDL grant is for up to $10,000. As it was originally written, that's what they were offering. And then there was a ruling um, by the SBA saying that they were going to give um, $1,000 for every employee that you have. So if you applied for this $10,000 grant and you were self-employed or single employed, they supposedly only give you $1,000. I have heard that that does not correspond to the letter of the law of the CARES Act, and there, there's people that are contesting that, uh, fighting, saying that um, they're going to go back and require them to give you the full 10000 That's the only thing I've heard. What I, uh, what I hear that is happening is you're getting $1,000 per employee up to $10,000. Um, my understanding uh, regarding the forgiveness is I can't give you a clear answer on if you get the $10,000 grant and the bridge loan if, it, if it's going to be forgiven. Maybe David can chime in on that. My understanding is, is that if you get a, either the PPP loan or the EIDL and you got the grant, they're going to count that um, towards. But I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, so I'll try to get that answer and, and, uh, and follow up somehow. Um, so Marie also says that she believes it's a 3.75%. Yes, that's the interest rate of the, of the EIDL loan. That's the federal loan that you can repay back or that you must repay back. That's the interest rate that they're giving, which I think the general consensus, it's a very, very good rate. Um, so if any of you were thinking to, you know, if you have a way to use that and it can benefit your business, it, it may be a good strategic decision. 
Okay, the deadline for the EIDL program, I believe it is still active. You can still apply for it. Uh, so if you haven't, uh, go to the SBA website and you can apply for the grant and then it'll go through the program. Um, next question from Linda is, do you know if you can receive a PPP loan using an 1120S schedule instead of the Schedule C? Yes, you can. Um, I actually got my PPP loan and uh, I am a corporation in the state of Florida, subchapter S. A Schedule C, I believe it is used for people who are self-employed. That's what they used to file. Uh, so we have a uh, Cheech. Uh, this question is, you can't use the EIDL SBA loan for capital assets, anything over $2,000. Can't use it to pay off another loan. The interest is accrued up front. It must be used for regular office expenses, including salary. So he brings a very, very good point. Um, it's very important to understand that the uses of the EIDL are limited. It's basically general business expenses. So what, what, the, what he means by capital expenses is, um, you know, I would imagine that that would include if you wanted to buy real estate for your business, anything that's going to add to the, uh, basically the asset base of your business. So there is limitations. It's important if you are going to take the EIDL to understand what you can and can't use it for. Generally, uh, general business expenses like payrolls, like rents, like utilities, internet, things like that can be used. Um, if there's anything out of the ordinary, you really need to read the fine print on there and, uh, and understand that. Um, so I think all the uh, questions um, are up. If anyone has any questions, they haven't put them in. If they put them into the chat box, please put them into the Q&A section and hopefully we can answer them. And I think I'm going to turn it over to either David, Natalia, or Jennifer, if anyone has anything to add and we'll keep our eyes open for any last minute questions that pop in. So We do have someone that did raise their hand. So I wanted to go ahead and open his mic, Steward. Are you there, Stuart? Can you hear us? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here with you. Hi, Stuart. Welcome. And go ahead and ask your question. Uh, it was more a comment just about the injections that David, uh, he, had, he had responded back to me. As a pharmacist, I'm on both sides of the fence. So uh, in pharmacy, we are only allowed to dispense legend products. You know, products are on prescription. There's a federal uh, labeling on a drug that says, this product is to be dispensed upon the written order of a licensed physician. So in injectable products, when a compounding pharmacist prepares a product, it's considered a, lic it's considered a legend drug product to be dispensed only on someone that's licensed to prescribe. I think it's in 457. I can't remember exactly from my pharmacy rules, but um, so it's, it's tough. It's kind of a gray area and some pharmacists right. will not Dispense compounded drugs to acupuncturists for fear of losing their license. Well, that's where hopefully, thank you, Stuart, is the question is if these homeopathic products choose to go through the, um, the pre-market approval route with the FDA, hopefully when they get on the other side of that, um, based on the safety efficacy and, you know, common uses of it, the FDA would would then turn around and say that it's still available by prescription, but they may say something like it's available by prescription by, um, you know, qualified or certified practitioners in the state or something like this, as opposed to like they do with acupuncture needles, as opposed to, which is by prescription only, but they right. provide some context for who can prescribe it. So it would still be, we prescribe herbs, we prescribe, um, you know, dietary protocols, we just, you know, we prescribe lots of things. It's just hopefully they'll extend that privilege to us um, for homeopathics. Right. And restricted to use by a medical doctor or DO or something like this. But it's, you're right, it's, it's in their hands and we, we won't know until a company goes that route to see what happens to it. Because to me, the other, the strange thing is that because it's homeopathic, it falls under, um, you know, falls out, oh, pardon me, because it has certain exemptions at the FDA, it's, it's not regulated in a way that requires uh, pres prescription in the, in the conventional sense. And then it might say something like it can, it can be um, dispensed or provided by a practitioner certified in the discipline. You know, it has a lesser requirement. And so, you know, something is available, a consumer can't go online and buy it themselves. They have to have a under the care of a licensed professional. 
So there, there's probably some wiggle room for the FDA to use appropriate language so that it doesn't become too restricted a, a, a substance. But that's, and like I said, I'll leave that for another time because we won't know until they get through that pre-market part of it with the FDA to, and, and how the stakeholders come to a determination through probably the homeopathic consortium and the FDA regulators just to say, you know, this is the, the route that we want this product administered and to leave room for non-physician providers to be able to do that. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you, Stuart. Thanks, Stuart. I that. appreciate it as always. Yeah. And we have, this is going to be our last question for tonight. Uh, Vera, I am opening your mic. You can go ahead and ask your question, Vera. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Okay. Uh, my question may be not exactly about uh, today our discussion, but I think it can be very interesting for everybody. Because when we close now and we don't do directly business for acupuncture, how we can get reimbursement, if we can, for telemedicine uh, education acupressure session with a patient? If it's uh, allowed from our board to bill for this or not? Because I asked the same question yesterday in uh, NCCA meeting in town hall, and they sent me answer, you have to contact with your board. This right. is, I ask you if you know this. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. Ralph, I'll take a stab at that unless you, you wanna. Okay, so my thinking is twofold, is yes, telemedicine is included in the scope of practice for for Florida acupuncturists. Um, I and I have to double check, and I, I don't know for certain, but the presidential waiver for HIPAA compliant uh, technology, it may still be up and it, and it may be down. So this, this isn't something that you need to double check because use of a non HIPAA compliant um, technology is something that would not historically be acceptable in telehealth. It was waived during the COVID-19 pandemic in the early days so that there would be continuity of care and for providers who weren't um, already on a HIPAA compliant platform to provide telehealth services. So you can use FaceTime or Zoom or these other things. Um, but that the window for that is, is temporary. And I don't know if we're still under that open window or not. Um, but that's something we can find out for you. I'll, I'll look at it and, and I'll share the information with Natalia. And, uh, and we can get that information to you. But the second part of your question is, how do I get paid? How do I, how do I cover this? There's two, two things. One is if you're treating a patient as a, as a cash patient, um, this is not covered, you know, insurance is not involved with reimbursement for your care. I think you can set a, 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 a fee for service rate for telehealth in your office and bill your patient directly. And you treat it just like you would if you were, you know, sending them herbs or something like this. But you want to, you know, you want to make sure you have, you know, um, accurate and complete documentation of your encounter with this patient the same way you would if it was an in-person uh, encounter, uh, and then charge accordingly. If it's a person, if it's a patient that's covered under an insurance plan, then I would check with the provide. Pardon me, check with the carrier to make sure that. They, the patient probably has telehealth benefits, but they may not extend to acupuncturist. So they may have telehealth for their primary health care. They may have um, telehealth for some specialties like podiatry or wound care or, or some, some mental health counseling or, or something in this area. But they might say they have limitations on, on how those telehealth uh, services can be used based on the provider type or based on the service type. So those, that would be my answer. Check with the insurance company to make sure that it covers in acupuncture, telehealth consultation, if it's an insurance patient, if it's a non-insurance patient and just a cash patient of yours, um, you know, discuss your telehealth rate and build them accordingly. And, and uh, lastly is double check that you're using the appropriate platform. If you're still on a non-HIPAA compliant window, then you can use anything that's face-to-face but if that window is closed and everybody's supposed to be back on HIPAA compliant, then you need to have a platform service that allows you to, to, to uh, document your consultations that way. I hope that's helpful. 
Thank you, David. So we actually did a uh, Q&A telemedicine about eight weeks ago with Galena Rufner, and that is up Thank on you. our... Tell yes. <laughs> And that is up on our YouTube channel. In fact, we this uh, news update is being recorded. All our news updates are recorded in all our free webinars that we host every Monday night at 7 p.m. are always recorded and they're accessible to all of you um, free of charge. So I would say definitely start there. Um, there is a lot of good information there. There's an upcoming webinar um, with Maury West that we're doing July 18th and 19th in regards to billing best practices and how to begin billing and documentation. And she is going to talk about the current state of practice right now as it is. Um, it is not pre-recorded, it's something that she's gonna be teaching live and she will address issues that are affecting us currently at the moment. Um, so I would suggest that that would be a good start for everyone if you have any questions. There's got documentation, which is on the 19th and beginning billing on the 18th and that is on our fasoma.org website, just click over to calendar, go on to July 18th, 19th, and you can just register there. As a FASOBA member, you do get a very huge special pricing for that. That is only $180 for the two days or $100 for one day. And so I wanted to thank all of you for being here with us tonight. Thank you, David, Raphael, and Jennifer for your time. Um, I don't know where we would be without all of you. So thank you so much. And again, we invite you all to our annual conference, August 21st to the 23rd, three days. If you're a FASOMA member, um, if you're not, if you're a FASOMA member, it's only 180 for the three days. If you're not a member, you can join us and support our work and our mission for as little as $25 a month. Again, thank you everyone. Thank you for being here and stay safe. Bye. Good night everybody, thank you.